What a joy it is to be with you once again. Amen. You know, you know it has been a while since we had been with you and uh, you know it's it is like coming back home to see all of you so desirous to know God's word and wanting to be in heaven. Uh, I was just uh, listening to the Sabbath school lesson study that you're having many of the glimpses of heaven you have been mentioning there and I really uh, want to thank each one of you for being a part of that. It has been such a wonderful study. Dr. Jacob had been able to lead us through that. And uh, we are going to reflect upon something so vital and so important. Our title for this message is Heaven, the Real Perspective. So often we miss understanding the real perspective of heaven. And it's time to revert ourselves, to refocus our attention back into the understanding of heaven. Yes, are people interested in order to understand what is out there? Recently, there had been some sensational news. People had been scrambling, probably, you know, almost like in competition. And these are the richest and wealthiest people on this earth, money. you know, you will find that on July 12th and July 20th, two billionaires wanted to go to the edge of space to find out what it is all about. Now, you can see that uh, this billionaire by the name of Richard Branson was the first one. He wanted to be the first one because he owned this. And therefore, he wanted to be there. This rocket was made for him. It was named as Unity, the Virgin Galactic um, Unity. That is, that is what uh, the spaceship was named after. And so his plan was to go to the edge of space and enjoy the weightlessness that is there and then come back. And true to his desire on July the 12th, there was, it was a one and a half hour mission that he had, but he was able to experience only eight minutes of floating. And that was the excitement that they had for eight minutes where he could enjoy this galactic space travel that he had. And he could be able to enjoy just for eight minutes of floating along with his team. You know, he traveled up to 85 kilometers, which means about 53 miles or around 282,000 feet above the sea level. That was only for eight minutes of thrill. The next in line was this man, many of you know, Jeff Bezos. He is the Amazon's founder, the one of the richest men on this earth he decided to go a little higher. And so he climbed up to 62 miles in his space, uh, in his spacecraft and in his uh, vehicle called as the Blue Origin. And he enjoyed 11 minute ride there in that weightlessness where they could float inside their spaceship. And they had to spend billions of dollars in order to experience a thrill of eight to 11 minutes. The question is, would you do that? Just for eight minutes of thrill? Let me tell you some amazing fact. There are, at this point in time, there are more than 600 people in line who had already booked their tickets from 2014. They have paid more than $2.5 billion to these people so that they can enjoy that thrill for a few minutes. If you see various religions, they also talk about a place called heaven and paradise. Ancient Mesopotamia, they talk about the upper, middle, and the lower universe, where heaven is in the uppermost part of the realm. 
and uh, most people descend into the underworld very few actually make it to the to to the upper world in islam their understanding of paradise is where the people you know if they do good things it will outweigh if the uh, if the good things outweigh the bad they'll be able to make their heaven uh, place to the paradise where they can be lazily you know enjoying the place called paradise surrounded by bashful dark eyed virgins and they will be drinking from crystal goblets and uh, they will have immortal youths they'll be clothed in green silk and uh, they will wear silver bracelets and they'll be drinking and enjoying that is their concept of paradise what about the buddhists for the buddhists it is something called as rebirth or samsara in numerous heavens a cycle of death and rebirth continues until they finally enter into what is called as nirvana which is a mental state it is not a literal space but it is kind of a, a mental state where they get into nothingness hinduism also have a similar understanding through cycles of death and rebirth they are released from the cycle of death and uh, once they enter into that state which is called as brahman which is kind of a vapor kind of a thing where all the atmas come together and merge in that universal atman which they call as moksha confucianism heaven is where people ancestors are so you are going to go into the ancestral land zoroastrianism from the fourth day that you die you have to cross a bridge called as the separator which widens when the righteous approach it now the righteous soul crosses the bridge and it is met by beautiful maidens he is then escorted to something called as the house of song which they await the last day on this day they all will be purified and finally taken into that place called paradise where they'll be youthful and rejoicing that is the kind of uh, hope that these people have what is the real perspective what is the reality in the word of god we have more than 500 verses that talk about heaven let's quickly get on to it to understand we begin with the promise that jesus made to his followers we all know that it's found in john the 14th chapter verses 1 to 3 jesus said let not your heart be troubled you believe in god believe also in me for in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so i would have told you i go to prepare a place for you and if i go surely i will come again to receive you unto myself that where i am you may be also jesus didn't talk about a mythical place he talked about a real place where real people are going to live and that is the hope that he left come with me on a journey as we take in our understanding to this real place called hell heaven as we journey together to this galactic space above the clouds we begin to enjoy and suddenly the gate opens before us and we are now let in we want to know what the thrill of heaven is all about what is the reality of heaven we are taken beyond the galaxies beyond the sky that you and i can perceive or see and we pierce through that space into a place where we are imagining could be heaven we need to climb many stairs and then we come to the most ex ex exquisite and beautiful place our minds are thrilled with this understanding there you can see beauty everywhere that you behold and there the city of god surrounded with the rainbow now you begin to walk closer you can see the entrance of that place called heaven you want to get a glimpse of it first corinthians 2 9 and 10 which we have read in our sabbath school it says i had not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which god had prepared for them that love him in other words 
even beyond description of the book of Revelation and of the whole scripture, there is something uniquely beyond our understanding that we ourselves have not been able to fathom. It, it is exquisitely beautiful beyond description. But God has revealed them to us by his spirit in the scripture. You know, one day the grandparents took a little child outside so that they can look into the starry heavens, the beauty at night. And so you'll find that uh, the girl was really fascinated and he began to tell this is the galaxy and you can find that this is the constellation that we have, Orion, this is Pleiades and this is the Big Dipper. He began to explain all these things and that is Venus and you can see the beautiful moon. Suddenly she opened her eyes in amazement and she said, Grandpa, if the bottom side of heaven is this beautiful, how wonderful the top side of heaven would be. How true it is. Heaven, the top side, is going to be much more beautiful. There is only one place this beautiful description is given and that is in the word of God. No religion describes it as clearly, as, as candidly as it is described in the Bible. It talks about where heaven is, what heaven will be like, where its capital will be, what people will be doing, what people will be like over there, where the saved will live, and what the capital city would look like. A doctor was visiting his dying patient. He was a Christian doctor. He wanted to prepare this man to tell him about something that would happen after he dies. He wanted this man to believe in Jesus and to be ready for the coming kingdom. And uh, he was trying to find words in order to talk what heaven is about. Because this dying man was asking how the heaven is and what would be the voice of God like? The doctor was fumbling for a while and suddenly he heard a scratch on the door. He realized that he left his dog outside and it was impatiently waiting and scratching the door. Then he got an idea. And then he told him, he said, you know, brother, I want you to understand this. I know you're asking how is it on the other side of heaven and what it is like? Let me illustrate. You know, when I came in, I left my dog outside. The dog does not know what is happening here. It cannot see, but it can hear my voice. And it is patiently waiting eagerly so that I can come to receive the dog. That is how it is, my brother. You and I might, might, might not be able to see, but we can hear the voice of our master, which is behind the door. The master is waiting for you. Won't you give your heart to him and be ready? That is how the Christian doctor was able to convey the message of heaven. Yes, in the Old Testament, Isaiah, the 65th chapter, verse 17 says, For behold, I create new heavens and new earth. Why do we need new heaven and new earth? Because God here says, I'm going to create new heaven and a new earth like it never was before. The answer is given why the necessity of new heaven and new earth. In Isaiah 51, 6, it says, lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke and the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. This world is like an old garment. It is waxing and waning and splitting. The pandemic had given us a good example of how this world had been ravaged torn to pieces with agony and cries of a helpless world. 
as you look into this worn out world, you can see tsunamis, floods that come out without expectation. Look at this little girl. In few minutes, she would drown to death. Look at the terror in her eyes. She tried to cling on to that tree, not knowing soon she'll be swept aside. That is the terrible agony of this world that look at this volcano spewing its hot ash. The lava that is flowing, you can see it has covered the bodies of people who are trying to flee from its clasp. That is the that was carried. In that ash, and they died clinging together. This is the harsh reality of the world that we are living in. You know, the Bible in the book of Revelation, God revealed to John as he was sitting there, he was sent to that island because of his faith. And God gave him a picture of a bright and beautiful glimpse of heaven found in the book of Revelation. Let me invite you as you open your Bibles to the book of Revelation, the 21st chapter and verse one. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, just like how Isaiah 65th chapter talks about. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. And in this world, Isaiah 60th chapter verse 18 describes, violence shall no longer be heard in your land, neither wasting nor destruction within your borders. Haven't you seen such violence everywhere? People wanting to destroy other people with bombs, with kind of biological weapon. In fact, the pandemic is known to be man-made. People wanted to kill others with this toxic gas attack. Look at these little children. What have they done to deserve this destiny? People sleeping in the night, not getting up in the morning because they didn't know that somebody had unleashed this poisonous gas. Look at this cruelty of people. People who are lined up and within their, with their machine guns, trying to slaughter them by the hundreds. What a violent world that we are living in. Our hearts really shudder, really shake in fear as we look into that. This is not the world, this is not our home. Isaiah 33 verse 24, it talks about that place called heaven and the inhabitant shall not say, I am sick. You know, by the time the second wave has come and it is enveloping the other countries, people are truly, truly gasping for breath. They are so sick and tired looking at the devastation, looking at the horribleness of the sickness and suffering that surrounds us, of the pestilences, the new plagues that are emerging. We know we are not going to survive for long, but there is a promise and a hope for mankind. Isaiah 35th chapter verse five, it says, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. Imagine what will be the expression of the blind man when he enters and see this beauty. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. For the first time, he'll be hearing the celestial anthem of the choir. Then shall the lame leap like a deer. The one who had never been able to walk will be able to leap like a deer. And the people 
who could not sing, the tongue of the dumb shall sing forth their rapturous song. What a beautiful description. In Isaiah 65, 21, it says, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. For as the days of a tree, so shall the days of my people be. And my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. So we are not going to be lazily sitting in some coaches and enjoying some beautiful drink or some sumptuous meal. We will be busy. There'll be so much to do in this place called heaven. This place, the city called New Jerusalem. Revelation 21 verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. You want to have a snapshot, a bird's eye view? Come with me to the book of Revelation, the 21st chapter. This description, surprisingly, is found not only in the Bible, but recent discoveries in the Dead Sea, the scrolls that were written in Aramaic, that text describes a vast city, rectangular in shape, 12 gates encircled by a long wall, almost the same description that is given in Revelation in Ezekiel. These people who are living in these Qumran caves, the Dead Sea Scrolls where they had written, had talked about a hope of the new coming city called as the New Jerusalem. This scroll is called as the New Jerusalem Scroll. If you go to the museum, you can read that text, which is right there. What does it describe? What does the word of God in Revelation describe? Come with me to verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Yes, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. What more do you need when you have God with you? And the city? Take a look at this glimpse that is given here. It is laid out as a square. The length of it is as the breadth of it. And the height of it is also the same. And so he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Do you know how much that means? Do you know the length and breadth of it? Let's make a quick math in order to understand it. A furlong is one fifth of a kilometer. And so 12,000 furlongs is equal to 2,400 kilometers. In other words, the length will be 2,400 kilometers. The breadth will be 2,400 kilometers and the height of it will be 2,400 kilometers. There has never been a city like that which was ever built on this earth. This place is called as New Jerusalem. Come with me as we begin our journey to understand this New Jerusalem. It is simply scintillating. The beauty of it is beyond description. If you were to place that you know, in this North America, it would almost cover the whole, the whole country. In fact, you will find that that is only the length and breadth that you're looking at. If you look at the height of it, and if you have to place it in the Middle East, it would cover the whole area that is described in that, in that uh, rectangular space that is given there. You know, John, he was a Jew. He understood what Jerusalem was all about. But imagine as he begins to fathom how huge this city was. For him, even that little city of Jerusalem was so precious. But God is showing something beyond description. It is about 2,400 kilometers. Vastly so huge. 
that he cannot even fit into this imagination. But if you have to really take it into the height of it, it is almost about 1,500 miles tall. Was there ever a city equivalent to that? No way. Now let's compare to what this, uh, you know, the billionaires have done. I told you that they climbed probably up to 65 or 85 kilometers, one of them. And the other one had gone a little bit, probably about 95 kilometers. There is a line that is called as the Carmen line. This is an imaginary line where the people, the aeronautics can operate, where you have a thin air and uh, all the sports are done within that. It's about 100 kilometers above the sea level. Beyond that, only the astronauts can journey. So if you draw the Carmen line onto this city, this new Jerusalem, it is nowhere in comparison. It is almost, almost like the basement, 100 kilometers. Imagine this city is going to be 1,500 miles tall. Wow. Can you imagine sprouting up, up to that height? is beyond, beyond description. And you and I can have the desolate planet. being there. Come with Jesus me. Commands the Let us hurry up into trying to understand graves. this new Jerusalem word, is going to come onto this earth every after the place. thousand years now have expired. God. And then you the can lost see as the new the Jerusalem is descending, the death. people who are outside the as city Jesus to see Jesus descending the Mount of heaven. Olives. And a as Jesus descends upon the, mountain, the Mount of Olives, into a great it splits into two. Then and the now new you'll find new the Jerusalem city of is God going to make its place. From the heavens, and it and upon the throne said, Behold, that, I make all things new. Across the sky. And he said this unto me, Jerusalem, right, this new Jerusalem for that these the words are true is going to and travel. Faithful. And as it travels, you can see the beauty beneath it. Imagine if you have to be there in New Jerusalem, how beautiful that would look like. And finally, on that flattened place of Mount of Olives, this New Jerusalem, which I have talked to you about, is going to find its place on this very earth. This is what Jesus had said that he has prepared a place for you and me. You and I can have access to this beautiful city called New Jerusalem. That is where our heritage is all about. And that is where God is calling us so that we can find our entrance into this place called New Jerusalem. God wants us to be there. And as you read in the book of Revelation, the 21st chapter, the beauty of it is beyond description. The very foundations of it are made of different precious stones. And the names of the disciples are etched there. As you look into the beauty of this place called New Jerusalem, one mathematician had estimated it could simply hold only in that city more than two billion feet in that city. Imagine it can hold throughout this whole planet Earth that God is, had prepared for each one of us. And he showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Revelation 21 verse 10. And this city, as you begin to see, its radiance was like the most precious stone. It is almost like a crystal that you can see at a distance. It had a great and lofty wall, so high, and had 12 gates and 12 angels at these gates. And on the gates were inscribed the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. On every side you have the names and on the east were three gates, on the north three gates, and the south three gates, and the west three gates. Every side you have the three gates on this crystal palace. The wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them the 12 names of the apostles. 
Now the one who was speaking to me was holding a golden reed to measure the height of the wall. And he also measured its walls about 144 cubits according to man's measure. This is huge wall that you can find probably up to the Carmen's line maybe. There you can see inscribed on those foundations. The city looked like pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations were adorned with every sort of precious metal. The first was made of jasper, the second sapphire, and the third chalcedony, and the fourth emerald. You can see the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius. Now we come to the seventh chrysolite. We have the eighth beryl. Then we have the ninth topaz and the tenth chrysoparis, the eleventh hyacinth, and twelfth amethyst. These are the twelve foundations, and the gates were twelve pearls. Each of them was made unto one pearl. And as you begin to walk in, you can see the whole city made up of gold. Her light was like a most precious stone, like jasper stone, clear as crystal, and a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeded from the throne of God and of the Lamb. The street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And everywhere that you see, just beauty to behold. One rich young man, the pastor had come to him and asked him to give his heart to Jesus. He said, you know, you'll find a place called heaven so beautiful. He said, really? Yeah, if you give your heart to Jesus. And so that night he dreamed a dream where Jesus was inviting him to come into this place called heaven. And so he decided that he's going to pack his most precious things and take it along. So in his suitcase, he was having something so heavy and as he was walking, Jesus asked him, what do you have there? Said, Jesus, please, please don't ask me, but let me get through these pearly gates. I will let you know later on. And Jesus said, you don't need that. No, 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 I, I definitely need it. Please allow me to go in. So Jesus smiled and he said, you go yonder and there's an angel that will escort you inside. And so this man comes to the gate and there the angel was there. And he said, uh, you know, brother, what are you bringing in your suitcase? He said, you know, Jesus had told me I can take it inside. Can I know what is inside? No, I don't want to tell you. But just please let me know what is there. Let me have a look at it. So, you know, peevishly, he just opened it. His face was blushing. And there he had gathered all the precious stones that he could earn in this life. You know, the angel smiled at him and he said, brother, you don't need it there. He said, but why? Because all these are pavement stones there. You can leave them outside before you can come in. Heaven is the most beautiful place and the precious things that you and I scramble are just like pavement stones there. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruits, yielding its fruits every month. You are discussing that in your Sabbath school. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. Look at this beautiful verse in verse 4. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death nor sorrow. During the time of the pandemic, People had been wrenched from their precious relatives, from their loved ones. They had been separated. People who have been long parted will all be united in one accord. What a glorious, grand reunion that will be. People who have been yearning to see their loved ones will once again see them in the eternal you, in the glory of heaven. People who have been separated miles apart 
I know the agony of that separation. I know what it means to be separated from a loved one. You know, my father was buried far away from where my mother had been buried recently. But this promise tells me that one day they will all be united together. There will be no more tears, no more crying. There will be no more pain for the former things have passed away. All what you have been bothered with, all that had broken your heart will all be gone. We will have a country home that we ourselves will build and each weekend we'll go to the capital of the city. It says here, they shall build and not another inhabit. They shall plant and not another eat. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine in it for the glory of God gives its light and the lamb is its light because there is no more night are you frightened of darkness? You don't have to be because God is going to be the light. This world is going to be the center where God is going to be. Something more wonderful, just like how we have been enjoying in Isaiah 63 verse, uh, 66 verse 23. And it shall come to pass from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, save the Lord. We will have a blessed Sabbath school at the feet of Jesus. The ransom of the Lord shall return and come with Zion with singing. Think about the beautiful choirs that will be there with everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. All this while you have been hearing about the literal, the literality of heaven but i want to take you on another journey of a real perspective the real reality of heaven what is this true perspective and who can be there they have done a study in 2003 it is a barnapol they wanted to know what the people understood about heaven. 76 persons of the Americans believed in heaven, a large number. 71 person believed in hell. But of all those who believed in heaven, 50 person believed that you can go to heaven without accepting Christ as your savior. That is what the vast majority of people believe. Somehow they can get to the other side and be there even without Christ. I want you to open your eyes to the reality, to the new perspective, the real perspective of heaven. You know, in the ancient, in the Old Testament time, the Bible often described the earth with literality. It talked about a kingdom of this earth. And all the Jews and the Israelites looked at this literal place in Palestine. It was an earthly temporal prosperity. There would be benefits and uh, they will have their interest in earthly things. And everything that they did as a blessing from God always flowed through that channel of literal blessings, literal richness prosperity, health, wealth, all these things in that literal way. And they begin to be behave in an earthly way. But you will find that when Jesus had come to this earth in the New Testament time, he had opened another chapter. He talked about the kingdom of heaven. Sadly, many of the people, including his disciples, were disillusioned and disappointed with the vision of the kingdom of heaven that Jesus was giving them. This was a place where we are delivered from earthly ways, where we begin to look at the reality of spirituality, where our interests will be heavenly. We look at things from God's viewpoint and not from earthly viewpoint. So what is this heaven all about? Jesus named this as the kingdom of heaven. 
Today, we don't have kingdom, but we have the government. And therefore, Jesus was talking about the government of heaven. So what is salvation in terms of the kingdom of heaven? Salvation is where we are saved from the kingdom of the earth to the kingdom of heaven. Where we are saved from the attachment of the world where we come under the authority of heaven. If I have to ask you this question, how many of you would want to be in heaven? I'm sure all of you would raise your hands. But you know what? Honestly speaking, we all want to go to heaven after we die. But we do not want the rule or the authority of heaven in our own life now. We don't want the citizenship of heaven now. In other words, we want to be fully citizens of this earth. And later on, when we die, somehow we want to find our way in heaven. Even the people, the remnant people have that. Security, no inferiority, no jealousy, no hatred, and no loneliness this is what we need to see the reality of the citizenship of heaven so we can place ourselves under the question where does heaven actually begin you know, our first home was paradise. We know that. Adam lost it. We know the last home is going to be paradise. That is what was described in Revelation. We are in between these two paradises, making our journey towards heaven. And the journey begins here. Where the government and the authority of heaven and Christ is recognized on earth, where its principles are followed. And therefore, the days of heaven does not begin after we reach there. It begins here, where we have learned to put an end to strife, to conflict, where we have learned to enjoy the peace and joy and self-sacrificing love everywhere. That is where heaven begins. Jesus himself said in Luke 17, 20, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, they were interested. When it will begin? He answered and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there. Look at this punchline. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. It is within your reach. The kingdom of God does not begin there. It begins right here. This is a fascinating verse. Even I myself was so thrilled to see this text here given in the Old Testament. I want you to open and perhaps underline it. Deuteronomy, the 11th chapter, verse 21. This is God's desire. That your days may be multiplied and the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon this earth. Did you see that? As the days of heaven upon this earth. In other words, God wants us to enjoy a little piece of heaven right here. A heaven on earth. So that by the time we are transported, we are like the astronauts ready to live there. I want you to look at this very carefully. There are some things that begin here on earth. There are some things that happen in heaven. We had already seen this is the real perspective. We know that sickness will not be there. We know that there's not going to be death in heaven. No hunger, no crime, no war, no city of gold, no tree of life. The, the tree of life will be there, city of gold will be there. All these things can only happen in heaven. You cannot have it here on this earth. But what is it that is going to happen on this earth? 
we need to eliminate all hatred from our lives. You cannot go to heaven and think of eliminating it there. It has to happen here. There won't be any jealousy. We need to see that there is no jealousy in our life. It has to happen here or we will not find ourselves here. We need to eliminate every bitterness, every trace of insecurity. We need to learn how to think good about others sacrificing for others all these must begin here on this earth perhaps many might be surprised as we begin to understand this but the bible has given us in clear understanding let's look at it in philippians 1 10 that he may approve the things that are excellent that he may be sincere and without offense till the day of christ did you see that sincere and without offense till the day of christ so it begins right now and here because our conversation is in heaven from whence we also look for the savior the lord jesus the real perspective of heaven is not that we somehow die and begin to enjoy the bliss over there we need to enjoy here now as you look at this text i want you to honestly introspect and give me the answer. Where does this category of people begin? Whether it begins here or whether it begins in heaven. Let's look at it in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verse 5. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness. So being without covetousness will happen here or will it happen in heaven? It says it begins here. First Timothy 4.12, let no man despise the youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Temporary life begins right here on this earth. First Peter 1.15, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation. Where does this holiness begin? Where does this holiness encapsulate us it is right here many people are thinking that holiness begins in heaven no it has to begin here first peter 2 12 having your conversation honest among gentiles whereas they speak against you as evildoers that they may by your good works which they behold glorify god in the day of visitation seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness so let me ask you is it here or in the hereafter the holy conversation and godliness begins here or it begins there the answer is resoundingly clear titus the second chapter verse 11 for the grace of god that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men here and now teaching us listen to this denying ungodliness worldly lust we should live soberly righteously and godly where in the present world that is where heaven begins looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great god and our savior jesus christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works underline this this is god's desire that we need to live without worldly lusts soberly righteously and godly in this world if we are having conflicts if we are having jealousies if you are having hatred time that we get rid of this because we need to belong to another place we need to be citizens of heaven Look at these promises that are given here. Colossians 1.28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Paul's desire was that he may present them perfect here, right here itself, that it begins. In 1 Peter 5.10, that God might make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. In 2 Timothy 3.17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works that he may stand perfect and complete in the will of god colossians 4 12 right here on this earth 
Ephesians 4.13, till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We need to rise up to that stature right here on this earth. The finishing touch takes place here on this earth, not sometime in the future. First Peter 4, 1 Peter 1.4, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. God had reserved a place. That's what Jesus said. I'm going to go to and prepare a place for you. But that preparation of a physical place will only be fulfilled when there is a preparation of a spiritual place in our hearts with the authority and the kingdom of heaven right here. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. I hope we understand. We are thrilled and excited about the beauties of heaven, but there is something that we must begin here. We must get rid of all these unchrist-like behavior. So the question is, where is heaven? Many times we are looking at that beautiful fruit. Every month we'll be able to eat different types of fruits. That's all exciting. But let me tell you one secret. Heaven is not a place where Jesus is not there. You can have all the beauties that you can describe. Heaven is just the place where Christ is. Heaven would not be heaven to those who love Christ if he was not there. And therefore, we can begin our journey right here. It's a place of love. And that's what 1 John 3.11 says, for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we love one another. Yes, heaven is a place of love, but that love begins right here. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our life for our brethren, not in heaven, but here on this earth. That is the selfless love that we must be able to inculcate. Paul told us the characteristics of love, how it suffers long, how it is kind. It does not envy. It does not want itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave itself unseemly, does not seek her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, believeth in all things, hopeth in all things, endureth in all things. Where does this love begin? Not somewhere beyond. Paul was not writing that someday, one day we will all become like that. He's talking about how with the grace of Jesus Christ, with the power of the Holy Spirit, we will be able to have this love here on earth. That is heaven. The best example is in the Old Testament. Enoch had temptations as well as we have. He was surrounded with society no more friendly to righteousness than that is which surrounds us. The atmosphere he breathed was tainted with sin and corruption the same as ours. Yet, he lived a life of holiness. Remember, he didn't see Jesus. He didn't have the gospels with him, but yet he lived a life of holiness. He was unsullied with the prevailing sins of the age in which he lived. Listen to this. So may we remain pure and uncorrupted. He was a representative of the saints who live among the perils and corruptions of the last days, talking about us of the last days. For his faithful obedience to God, he was translated. Listen very carefully. So also the faithful who are alive and remain will be translated. So also, the faithful who are alive and remain will be translated. How long did he live that life? For 300 years, Enoch had been seeking the purity of heart that he might be in harmony with heaven. For three centuries, he had walked with God. Day by day, he longed for a closer union. Nearer and nearer had grown the communion. 
He had stood at the threshold of the eternal world, just only a step between him and the land of the blessed. And now the portals of heaven opened. The walk with God for 300 years, so long pursued on this earth, continued as he walked through the gates of the holy city, the first from among men to enter there. To such communion, God is calling us, as was Enoch, must be their holiness of character, who shall be redeemed from among men at the Lord's second coming. So who are the ones who will make it to heaven? The ones who have lived like Enoch, day by day, yearning for a closer relationship with God, walking with God on a daily basis. And then it will be just a step away to heaven. Jesus talked about heaven and said this in Mark 10, 15. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as this little child, he shall not enter. You have heard some astounding truth that heaven begins here. Love begins here. Holiness begins here. That jealousy, bitterness, and anxieties need to be got rid of right here on this earth. And we need to walk like Enoch. Are you willing to receive like the little child? Or are you saying, no, 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 I, I don't think it's possible. Maybe when I look at myself, my life is so filthy that I cannot live that. Yes, your life and my life. When we look at heaven's viewpoint, will not be a candidate for heaven. But through the blood of Jesus and his life and the power of the Holy Spirit, we can live like Enoch. I hope you would say amen to that. That's why Jesus said in Luke 13, 24, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in. No point in having a vision of heaven. It says we need to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and had shut the door and he begin to stand without and knock at the door and saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say, I know you not whence ye are. Then you begin to say, Lord, we have eaten and drunk in thy presence. We have taken part of the Sabbath school. We have been here, remnant people, Seventh-day Adventists, that thou hast taught in our street. We listen to your messages. But he shall say, I tell you, I know not whence ye are, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, because we did not prepare for heaven here. That is why Jesus says, we need to long for heaven right here. For in this tent we groan, longing to put our heavenly dwelling right here on this earth. And Revelation 21 ends by saying this and he that sat upon the throne said behold I make all things new and he said unto me write for these words are true and faithful verse 7 he that overcometh he that overcometh shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son this is the calling that God fourteen twelve. Here is the patience Very of the soon saints. we are going Here to are see they that keep the commandments of God and have the just faith like of Jesus. Enoch. It and is it just a step away. Who are alive and the for beauty Jesus. of heaven is waiting for us, for those who want to live like heaven on this earth. And as we enter in through that gate, as the ransomed ones are welcomed into the city of God, there rings out upon the air an exultant cry of adoration because the two Adam first paradise is brought into the second paradise and the second Adam stands in front of him and as Adam discerns the prince of the cruel nails he does not fall on the bosom of his Lord, but in humiliation casts himself at his feet, crying, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. 
Soon we shall be in our promised home. There Jesus will lead us beside the living stream, flowing from the throne of God, and will explain to us the dark providence through which on this earth he has brought us in order to perfect our characters. There we shall behold with undimmed vision the beauties of Eden restored. And when we hear that, casting at the feet of the Redeemer the crowns that he has placed on our heads, touching our golden harps, we shall fill all heaven with praise to him that sitteth on the throne. Every crown will be cast down before the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. This earth where God dwells is going to be the center of the universe. How God does it, we do not know. But that's what it says in Revelation 21, 3. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten and the lamb is the light thereof. This earth that has been marred, this earth that has been the center of the conflict, this earth where our precious Redeemer had been slain, this earth where Jesus hung between heaven and earth is going to be the center where every other will come to this place to behold the Lamb of God, the wonderful story of redemption. That day, one pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy declare God is love. That is the world. That is the world that you are awaiting. There was a man by the name of John living yonder in the city. He was a blacksmith. He was known to be the most rowdy and notorious person. The moment he opens his eyes only filthy and foul language. He had been a murderer and released. He had served his term living as a blacksmith. Anger and bitterness fills his heart and soul. There was a older couple. His name is Farmer Brown, 90 year old, both of them. Living a little away into the village. Once in a while, Farmer Brown would come to this man called John and get his work done for his dishes and other things and would go by, try to hold a conversation, but every sentence that he had uttered, he just sweared in the most filthiest language. People hated him. He was simply a loner living out his life. Here was this beautiful couple who had lived their life to the full, given their hearts and waiting for the call of God. One night he got a dream. The very next morning he got up early by six o'clock. He called his wife and said, please prepare something for me. I need to rush out. She said, what happened? He said, I'll tell you later on, I had this dream. I'll tell you and I need to go urgently. She said, how can you go? You're an old man. Doesn't matter. Give me that cane, my walking stick. I'm walking to the town. But you can't go. Yes, I am. I'll explain everything later on. Please fix, for, fix a breakfast for me. I'm on my way. Somehow he seemed to be animated. 
He seemed to be urgent. He needed to go to the town. And so quickly he had his breakfast and walked slowly to the town. By the time he reached, it was 10 o'clock. The shops were all open. He slowly made his way into this blacksmith's place of work. He said, good morning, John. John suddenly looked at him. He was surprised to see Farmer Brown there. He said, Father, Farmer Brown, what brings you here? He said, that's the reason I came to tell you. I want to tell you something so urgent and I want you to listen. Last night, I had a terrible dream. You know, you know, my wife and I had been waiting for the call of God anytime. We are prepared to go to that place called heaven. And last night I saw such a beautiful dream. There my whole room was surrounded with angels and their rapturous songs. It looked like I was really out of this world. And slowly the angels now told me that time for me to go to that pearly gates. And I was transported through space and I was carried out. And there I could see this exquisite beauty of heaven where all the ransomed people were full of joy and happiness. I could see Jesus there. Many people surrounding him. They were worshiping him. Everything, John, was so beautiful. I was looking for familiar faces there in heaven. I looked everywhere. But I didn't see you, John. My heart was so troubled. I looked some more in another corner and another place. And I asked people who are familiar. They said, we didn't know. We don't know whether John is here. I asked the angel. The angels also could not answer me. Quickly, I ran up to Jesus and said, Jesus, I want an answer. I want to know why John is not here. Jesus took me aside. He said, Mr. Brown, you asked me why John is not here. I want to tell you, John is not here because no one invited him. John is not here because no one invited John to come here. Oh, his heart was broken. He said, Master, are you telling me that no one invited John to come? Jesus said, yes. He fell at the feet of Jesus and said, Master, just give me half an hour. Just permit me half an hour. Let me see John. With that, I woke up. John, I came all the way to let you know. Please come. John was still so stubborn, was not moved. No flicker you could see on his face, stern as a rock. He told John, please. Accept Jesus. He remained unmoved. Finally, Farmer Brown began to turn away. But before that, he turned back to John and said, John, I want you to know I have come all the way to give you this invitation. I want you to know the invitation has been given for you to come to heaven. I may not see you anymore, but I pleaded with Jesus that there must be someone to invite John to come home. 
as I depart, I want you to know that precious invitation had been given to you, John. Tears in his eyes, Farmer Brown walked away. John began to do his work. His mind was shattered, confused. He could not hit the hammer on the place that he wanted to. Everything was going out of control. He did not know what had happened to him. He tried to concentrate. He couldn't. He tried to do his work. It was not possible. Quickly, he shut his shop, went home to his wife, and he said, you know, get my vehicle ready. Where are you going? I want to see Farmer Brown. Why? He came to invite me to a place called heaven. I know he has only a short time, but before he leaves this world, I want to let him know that I have accepted the invitation. Quickly, he raced to the home of Farmer Brown. The man was lying on the bed at his last last grasp and gasp of air he shook this man and he said farmer brown i have accepted your invitation i will be with you i have accepted the invitation as we enter the portals of glory there'll be one mark that unites us all together, as little children begin to ask the story, what happened to your hand? Jesus will bear those marks that unite each one of us, the tokens of his humiliation. Our highest honor through eternal ages, the wounds of Calvary will show forth the praise and declare his power that everyone is invited to heaven. Have you reached out? Have you reached out to the people and invited? Is John there? As you enter that place, unfettered by mortality, you and I will wing that tireless flight to the worlds afar with sorrow at the spectacle of human awe that once rang with the songs of gladness at the tidings of the ransom soul with unutterable delight. The children of earth will enter into the joy and the unfallen being. Oh, that there are many Johns who are there around this place. There are many Johns that need to have that invitation they're just waiting for someone to walk by not only that we are thrilled with that joyous and rapturous beauty of heaven it's time for us to reach beyond the pandemic to a world that is dying with this perspective of heaven not only that it's a place of beauty but heaven begins right here right here and right now may god give us that wonderful privilege and the power and the grace to begin our journey with earnestness right here on this earth as we listen to this song of new jerusalem a beauty beyond description new jerusalem that begins here
I saw the holy city descending from the sky, so brilliant with the light of God. The city is his bride. There is no temple in this town. No sun.